my name is Fu Min, and uh, I am a novice monk here. Uh, and this is, first of all, a great honor to be able to get the chance to talk to you in this way. Uh, let's see. I, I, I've been thinking about this because as I left last week, Roshi said, well, maybe we'll have you do the talk this week. So I had a little bit of time to think about this. And I think what I'm going to do is work with the title of The Great Truth of Zen in eight words. Now, of course, I'm not going to tell you what those eight words are right away because I've got a talk to give. So, uh, the... It, my story kind of, it starts a long, long time ago when I was a, a, a boy uh, and I was a, a student at a, a Catholic school. And I was a pretty serious student because I wanted to be one of two things when I grew up. Sandy Koufax, I know he's a Jew, or a Jesuit priest. Those were the two things that I wanted to be. And uh, then... Uh, things happened to kind of make me wonder about my Catholicism. And one of those things was the idea of original sin. This idea that we're born with a sin. And that if we don't become baptized, we'll carry that sin with us our entire life. And it will very likely result in our eternal damnation in the fires of hell. And as an eight or nine year old boy, I thought, well, that's not very fair. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, my family moved away. I stopped going to a Catholic school, went to a public school, and it's all really been downhill since then. <laughs> <laughs> Until about... Uh, around my 60th birthday, which was when, about seven years ago, coming up on it, when I came up here and uh, uh, saw the, uh, uh, the monks and, and met Roshi and, uh, and had a definite affinity for this place and these people. And uh, at that time, the, the center was a little bit different. If you've been in the Sangha Hall down here, you walk in now, and it, you, you open the door, and, and there are all the... There, there's primarily a counter there that has some very nice stuff that you can uh, uh, buy. There are teachings in there. There's there's books. There's there's malas that Kamang has made. There's all kinds of nice stuff there. When I first came here, it was... You walked in the door, and it was books. It was It was books on both sides of the door. And as a novice who, uh, not even a novice, as an individual who hadn't really had much information on Buddhism, it was like uh, it was like a banquet. There were books everywhere, all on Buddhism and other religious ideas, and they were all interesting books. And so I, I went through the books and was looking for something, and I recognized some titles of some sutras, and I recognized some titles of some authors, and then there was a book there that was just unusual, given all the other books that were there. It was, first of all, it was rather thin. It was a slender, tall volume. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was big. It was, it was, you know, that size. Eight and a half by 11. It had a very nice cover on it. I, I opened it up. From the minute I opened it up, I could tell it, it was a handmade book. Someone had made this book. That opened it, started to look at, just figure out what it was. It was a little unusual because one of the things I could tell that it was handmade was that the pages were Xeroxed. So the pages were small, about a size of that book here, and they were floated like this bodhisattva in the center of the page. Okay. So I read it, and, and I was, I, I read. A poem that was in that book, written by Hakuin, who is a 
a 18th century Rinzai Zen master, a poet, artist. Uh, I, I read this poem and, uh, you know, it was a remarkable poem. Uh, I had to have the book. I just had to have it. I asked Roshi, Roshi, can I take this book? And Roshi said, oh, sure, sure, go ahead. Just bring it back. Because he'd probably only seen me once or twice. And, and I, you know, I looked pretty flaky back then. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he said, yeah, sure, take it. Just bring it back. Just make sure you bring it back. And I took it home and started reading it. And uh, I, I, was, I was horrified because a page fell out of it. <laughs> One page came out. And then another page started coming out. So I called him you know, on the phone and said, Roshi, Roshi, uh, you know that book you gave me? It's, it's kind of coming undone a little bit. I have some tape. I can tape it back together again if you want me to. And Rosie's just like, yeah, sure, whatever you want to do. Try and fix it. Sure, yeah, that's a good idea. Great, great, fine. Talk to you later. Bye. So I, I ended up taping it back together very gently and bringing it back up the next weekend because I found the book for sale, not in its handcrafted version, right? And it's a book called A First Zen Reader. And it, it, it was, written in the, uh, was written in the 60s uh, by a, by a, a guy uh, who, uh, uh, Trevor Leggett, who was a Brit who went to Japan and uh, uh, sat in on a couple of sequence of Dharma talks and lectures by a, a Zen teacher who was, was basically two-thirds of the book is the poem and this Roshi's line-by-line -line analysis of the, the poem. Uh, and uh, my, my thinking on the whole thing was, uh, you know, it, it, it really jump-started my feeling, my deep feeling for Buddhism. Uh, I was, you know, I was so moved by it that I then began to figure out how I could commit it to memory, just because it was that good to me. And I began to, uh, I, I would go on a walk uh, at uh, uh, a lunchtime in Huntington Beach, where I worked at the time, and I would, I would just run through the poem again and again and again until I had it to where was committed to memory. And another thing I did with it that was kind of, I think, interesting and impactful to my practice was that uh, I, I, I would then incorporate lines of it as I memorized it and use it as a, a bit of a starting point or an intention in my meditation. And, and it, it was nice. It was, it was a nice way to, to uh, kind of dive into the depth of the poem. And uh, and kind of, in effect, in effect you know, uh, see it for, for its great depth and its great uh, lyricism and its, its uh, uh, explanation of, of key Buddhist ideas. Uh, the, uh, and, and, Rather than, I guess, keep you waiting, I'm going to uh, read the poem. Okay. Now, the important words, the, the great truth of Buddhism, well, Hakuin knew what he was doing. He was going to write a masterful poem. But unlike me, a novice, he figured out and a lead with the most important line in the poem. So if you've hung in this long, you don't have as much time to go as you think. <laughs> but I'm going to read it to you anyway. <laughs> and the other interesting thing about this poem, just to give it one last shot here, uh, is this poem is incorporated in if you, you if you're a uh, if you've been here and you're a regular here, you've, you know the lyrics and the idea behind this poem because this poem, Roshi 
and Tianan put together a translation of this poem that is a chant that we do here. It's in the chant book. They've adapted it, and it's different because it's a chant, and this is different because it's a poem. But they both, I think, do a great job of giving us some insight into the ideas that are important in Buddhism. So now you're, you're probably ready for the words, right? This is called, in this book it's called the Song of Meditation, but our chant book it's called the Song of Zazen. And that may be the, the original title of the poem. You know, the English translator may have gotten a little bit over, overboard on the whole thing. All beings are from the very beginning Buddhas. Now, I just need to stop for one minute there because that was incredibly powerful for a Catholic kid who thought, original sin, that doesn't seem very fair. Why did God set that kind of thing up? But when I read those words, I was amazed. <laughs> All beings are from the very beginning Buddha. It is like water and ice. Apart from water, no ice. Outside living beings, no Buddhas. Not knowing it is near, they seek it afar. What? It is like one in the water who cries out for thirst. It is like the child of a rich house who has strayed away among the poor. The cause of our circling through the six worlds is that we are on the dark path of ignorance. Dark path upon dark path, treading. When shall we escape from birth and death? The Zen meditation of the Mahayana is beyond all our praise. Giving and morality and the other perfections, taking of the name, repentance, discipline, and the many other right actions all come back to the practice of meditation. By the merit of a single sitting, he destroys innumerable accumulated sins. How should there be wrong paths for him? The pure land paradise is not far. When, in reverence, this truth is heard even once, he who praises it and gladly embraces it has merit without end. How much more? He who turns in within and confirms directly his own nature, that his own nature is no nature. Such has transcended vain words. The gate opens, and cause and effect are one. Straight runs the way, not two, not three. Taking as form, the form of no form, going or returning, he is ever at home. Taking as thought, the thought of no thought, singing and dancing, all is the voice of truth. Wide is the heaven of boundless samadhi, radiant, the full moon of the fourfold wisdom. What remains to be sought? Nirvana is clear before him. This very place, the lotus paradise, this very body, the Buddha. Uh, I have five
five minutes or so. I could, would, would love to hear if you have a question or a comment. Uh, and, uh, you know, I uh, forgot to ring the bell. <laughs> did you uh, return and fix the bird? <laughs> I did. I did the best I could do to fix it, and I did return it to Roshi. And I, I don't know where it is because now, the, now the library is down in the in the monks' quarters. Oh, it's been moved from the samba hall. But it's still open to everybody, and you can go down there, and if you ever want to just look at an incredible collection of information and knowledge, you know, a lot of people I know in the group have been down there. It's a great spot. It's just been moved from there down. But I, but I, but I did a little bit of cataloging, not as much as Roshi or Tam Mung have done, with, with regard to cataloging all those books before they put them in there three or so years ago. That project went on for a couple of years. But I've not been able to find the book again, so I don't, I don't know what happened to it. Maybe, maybe the book didn't exist. Maybe it's all just something 